Love Talk Radio. Me chiamo Apura Kanu Apurai Taitnu Eneye Eguada Medinde O Girapo Kwesi Radnehmbuta Akan. Akwamumain Amaruka et TV Mu O Girapo. That means greetings to all Apurakani Apurai Kaitni people, meaning African black people. Today is Eguade Marketplace Day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Ranehmbata Akan. Ojirapo will be our Pamu nation in North America. And within Ojiramine, the purified nation of Apurakani Apurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you for tuning in once again to the show. We are, the uh, chat room is open now, and we're going to place some links in the chat room. If you have a question or a comment on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you are in the chat room, as you're logging into the chat room, if you'd like to interact in the chat room, you must um, have a username to interact in the chat room. If you do not have a username, you can create one quickly in Blog Talk so that you can interact in the chat room. So for the individuals who are new to the broadcast, as we place these links in the chat room, we have uh, three broadcasts on a weekly basis. On Joda Monday night, we have Akanfo Nanason, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion. And what we deal with on Joda Monday night, the Akan expression specifically of Nanasom, of Afurakani, Afuraikani, or African ancestral religion. We deal with specifically the Akan expression on Joda on Mondays because we are an Akan organization, but at the same time, there's misinformation that is being propagated regarding Akan philosophy, cosmology, ancestral religious practices, ritual practices, the nature of the great mother and the great father, Nyamewa and Nyame, the nature of the Abosom, the deity, the nature of the Nananum, Nsamampo, the spiritually cultivated ancestors, and ancestors, the nature of the Okra and the Okra, the soul, the divine consciousness, the nature of the Obra, Obra, the divine living energy within us, all of these various things. So we go into detail about that clarifying concept, clarifying reality through Akan culture, showing our ancestral connection, our inherited Akan ancestral connection come going from ancient Kana, which is a title of ancient Knesset, Nubia, Sudan, to the western part of the continent when our people migrated from ancient Kana, migrated west, reestablished the Kana Empire or Empire of Ghana a couple of thousand years ago after migrating from the Nile Valley, the Hapi Valley, and so forth. A thousand years later, some of our people migrated from the Ghana Empire, reestablished Akana civilization in the southern portion of West Afuraka, Afraikai, and therefore we began to engage our culture once again in the forest belt. Some of our people were forced from that region a few hundred years later into the Western Hemisphere, North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Ketia, the great perverse the enslavement era. But we carried our ancestral religious practices with us from ancient Kana to the western part of the continent, reestablishing a Kana civilization and into the western hemisphere. And those of us who maintain our ancestral religious traditions in the western hemisphere are those who wage war against the whites and their offspring and force the end of enslavement in the western hemisphere. So, and of course, we, we're going to get into that Akan expression of ancestral religion in the Western Hemisphere in North America, which is Hudu, which we are talking about tonight. So that's what we deal with on Joda on Monday night. On Benada, Abenada Tuesday, we have Ojira, purification. Ojira means purification. It also means a celebration of purification. Those are the definitions in the Akan language. Those are the definitions in the language of ancient Kemet and Kanat because, of course, our language is directly derived of that parent language. So purification, a celebration of purification. We always say that Ojira, purification, operationalizes Nanason. 
operationalizes our ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine vow. So whenever we talk about Nana song, Afurakani, Afurai Kaitni, meaning African ancestral religion, we're talking about the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine vow. That means through ritual, ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. Through ritual, we reject, repel, repulse, hate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions and realign ourselves with divine order. So the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion, of Nana Song, Afurakani, Afurai Kaiti, ancestral religion, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine vow. Ojira, purification, operationalizes Nana Song. Purification operationalizes our ritual incorporation of law and ritual restoration of divine vow. So this is what we deal with on Ojirada, Purification Day, on Binada, Abinada Tuesday, purifying concepts, cosmology, ritual practice, the nature and function of the Supreme Being, the Great Mother, the Great Father, the deities, the ancestral spirits, and so forth, with regard to Afurakani, Afurakani, ancestral religion in general, no matter what expression it takes, whether we're talking about our ancient ancestral expression of ancient Kanat and Kemet, or the contemporary expression of that ancestral culture and religious practice manifest through Akan and Yoruba and Ebe and Bodun and Ibo and Fula and Basa and Chokwe and Lobi and into the Western Hemisphere as Winti and Obia and Kandomble and Lukumi and Bodun and Grigri and Kudu and Juju and so forth. No matter what form it takes wherever we have gone into the world, we carry our ancestral religious practices in our blood circle. Our practices are transmitted directly from our ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circles, transcarnation. So we come into the womb assigned to specific abosom, assigned to specific nananom unsamanko. Because we're assigned to specific abosom and nananom unsamanko deities and ancestral spirits, once we are sent into the womb, prior to being sent into the womb, and once we get into the womb, we already have that. When we are born into the world, we are born into the world with a culture and a religion, a religious expression. So you cannot lose your culture. Even through enslavement, we were not able to, in reality, lose our culture. All we need to do is reconnect with the Abosom who are connected to us by blood. Reconnect with the Nananom Unsumapo who are connected to us by blood. So on Ojirada, when we deal with the purification of these concepts and understanding and so forth, texts from ancient Kemet, ritual practices from all over the continent and in the Western Hemisphere, wherever we have migrated or were forced to migrate in the world, we're showing the operationalization of Nanathon through purification. So we get into detail about that and show how it impacts every aspect of our lives. When we talk about the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance for the purpose of aligning and realigning every thought, every intention, and every action, every moment of every day with divine order and, of course, with our divine function and creation, and such religion, therefore, impacts every aspect, every moment of our lives. So this is what we deal with on Ojirada. And then, of course, on Awukuda, Akuada, Wednesday, we have Egua, which means marketplace. And what we typically do is have individuals come on who have businesses, organizations, and institutions in the Akurakani, Akuraikani community, our people who are serving our community in a positive capacity, who also maintain their ancestral religious values in the process, and their ancestral religious values inform their service to the community. So we've had a number of individuals come onto the show, sit with us for two hours and talk about their businesses, organizations, and institutions, how they started, their journey to ancestral religious practice, and how that those ancestral values inform their service, inform their philosophy, inform their 
interaction with our people in these businesses, organizations, and institutions. So in that process, we have published the Okong Economic Development Model, an economic development model rooted in our ancestral religious value. You can download that publication from our Ocom Economic Development page, as well as the four-part series that we did dissecting that model, as well as two other videos as well. You will also see a list of the businesses, organizations, and institutions who have come onto the show, and it's an ever-growing list. Also, you will see the links to their interviews that they did with us on the Egbua Marketplace show. Part of the Ocom Economic Development model is our strategy to starve the beast and feed the pride. It means we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have wasted with the white snarl spring, and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We take the funds we would have spent at their stores and reallocate those funds to the business organization or institution of the week. We are in the Okong economic development model operation. We are targeting one business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks. We started in February. This is, we are in the midst of this process as a community supporting a number of businesses, organizations, and institutions. Supporting one per week allows us to provide that business with optimal capital infusion. So when you starve the beast and feed the pride, when you take that $10 or $15 you would have spent at CVS or spent at Walmart or spent at Chipotle or spent at McDonald's or spent at Starbucks or spent at Burger King or wherever you would have wasted the funds, for a product that really does not serve you well at all, you starve the beast and feed the pride. You take that $15, reallocate it to the business organization or institution of the week. And when a 1,000 of our people do that, that is a $15,000 infusion of capital into a black business. If 10,000 of our people do that, that's a $150,000 infusion of capital into that black business in the course of a week. And that allows them to remain open, expand their services to us, hire people within the community in this unemployment issue. It is said that there are about 2 million Afurakani, Afurakani people, African people, black people in America who are unemployed. It is also said that there are between 1.9, 2 million black businesses in America. Of course, if every black business in America hired one person, then the unemployment problem would vanish overnight. The only way that that could take place is if we stop spending the 95 plus percent of the $1 trillion that passes through our hands instead of giving $950 billion of that to the whites and their offspring and their businesses, including white Europeans, white Americans, white Asians, white Hindus, white Arabs, white pseudo-Native Americans, white Latinos, white Hispanics, white Asians, and so forth, instead of giving them $950 billion plus dollars every year. We need to take that $950 billion plus dollars and spend it to million black businesses and then expand that to many more millions of black businesses as well. If we take the funds and starve the beast and feed the pride, we simply transfer the billions we give them and we transfer it to our people and their businesses expand, our businesses expand, and then we can hire our people and the hundreds of billions of dollars we were given to the white businesses, then their businesses collapse. So there's, it's not a new source of revenue. The revenue we already receive every moment of every day as we're working and so forth, the revenue we generate, we simply transfer that from our enemies to our people. And therefore, we, it's a win-win situation. If we do not engage that process, then by default, we are giving that money and leaving that money in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring, and therefore we are financing our own oppression. So this is what we deal with on Egua Marketplace Day, and then we also have shows on Egua Marketplace Day when we don't have a guest where we talk about the philosophical foundation rooted in our cosmology regarding business transactions, media of exchange, economic development economic value and worth rooted in our ancestral culture. We have our own means of approaching life and engaging one another economically based on our ancestral cosmology. So we deal with that as well. And that's the kind of information we're going to deal with tonight. So for the individuals who have come onto the line, 
Uh, again, if you have a question or a comment and you're on the phone line, hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you are in the chat room um, and you want to interact, you must log in as a user. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in Blog Talk so that you can interact in the chat room. So we put a couple of links in the chat room. And what we are talking about tonight, the business organization or institution, as we said, weekly, this is a special broadcast in a sense because the organization and the institution that we are supporting, of course, annual Hoodoo Mai, which is the Hoodoo Nation Festival. So we as Akwamu Mai, Amaruka Etikimu, the Akwamu Nation in North America, we are establishing our first annual Hoodoo Mai, Hoodoo Nation Festival. It will take place on October 17th in Washington, D.C. It's from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. It is a free event for Afurakani, Afurakani people to come and come shop with our vendors. We're going to have a number of vendors who are selling natural products, handmade products, clothing, natural soaps, handmade soaps, shea butters, um, cocoa butter, and so forth, handmade uh, clothing, and so forth, um, body oils, a number of different things, books, literature, art, all different kinds of products roots, herbs, natural healing, implements, and so forth. This is what our vendors will have, and you will have all day to shop with our vendors. We also are going to have some presenters. We will be doing a presentation on Kudu, the Yakan, ancestral religion in North America based on our book, Kudu People, Afurakanu, Afuraikaitu in North America, Akan, custodian of Kudu from ancient Kudu, Nduru, land, Kanit Nubia. We're going to get into some of that tonight. But we'll be doing a presentation, and we have a couple of other presenters, which is uh, tentative. So as you check the website, the Who Do Mind page on our website, we will constantly be updating you, and we'll place the list of the vendors on the page. Um, we'll be placing the itinerary very soon, the program very soon. So, of course, all day long, the free event, you'll be able to come in and out, and you'll have access to all of the vendors that include a live food vendor as well, raw live um, vegan food and so forth. So all day long you'll be able to engage that process, but at the same time we will have our program for libation and so forth, and then we'll move forward into having our presenters, the workshops and so forth, dealing with natural health, dealing with kudu, root work and so forth, as well as our presentation. So we're going to be posting all of that information. As part of that process, we are uh, publishing the Hudu Mind Journal, the Hudu Mind Nhoma. Every year we're going to have this festival, and every year we will have a journal, a book for the festival. We will be printing that book. Um, it will have articles on Hudu, articles on natural healing and so forth, rooted in our ancestral Hudu tradition, um, clarifying misconceptions and so forth. It will also be function as a Akurakani Akurakaiti Egua or marketplace, business directory. So all of the vendors will be listed and their contact information and so forth will be listed in the in the book, as well as um, ads from other businesses, organizations, and institutions from around the country, and we even have one outside of the country so far. That way it will be a business directory so people can, number one, they can study and learn about ancestral religion and culture, learn about the Hudu Mind Festival, um, but at the same time they can also connect with businesses, organizations, and institutions that are serving their needs, serving every need that we have. We have someone somewhere in the community who has a business organization or institution that is serving the needs and fulfilling the needs of our people. So it will function as a business directory as well. Uh, tonight, as a matter of fact, we had a deadline with regard to ads, placing ads in our journal. Because we have to get ready for the printing, we needed to get these ads in. So if you still would like to place an ad in the journal, and this journal would be given away freely to everyone who comes to the event. And of course, once they leave the event, they'll be sharing that with their friends and family and coworkers and so forth. So your Ad, when you place an ad in the journal, thousands of our people will see 
the ad. If you have a business organization or institution, thousands of people will see that and will be able to access you, have automatically expanded your customer base, your potential client base, and so forth. At the same time, we will also have an ebook version that will be placed on the Hoodoo Mind page, and of course, that's going to stay on there forever. So people will be able to access the ebook version and download that. They'll also be able to get the soft cover version as well. So your um, ad placed in our journal will reach actually hundreds of thousands of people, upwards of a million. The reason why we say that, when we place it on the website this past year, which for us, our new year just began on September 23rd, the first day of Asim Asimet, the equinox, September 23rd, that was our New Year's Day. That is our first day of 13,016. So we are in the year 13,016, just seven days into the new year. Over the past 12-month cycle from September 22nd to September 23rd, which is, was our year cycle, when we look at our stats for our website, we received over 1.34 million hits to our website. So people know they, when they come to our website, and for example, they go to our publication page, the Noma page, we have published 16 books dealing with various aspects of Akurakani, Akurakani culture, identity, cosmology, ancestral religion, revolution, resolution, and so forth, a number of different topics. They know they can download all 16 of our books for free. We also have the soft cover versions that we sell that range between $8 and $11, so they know they can come and download our books for free. We've also published over 60 articles, and they know they can download those for free as well. So we have 1.34 million people who have uh, hit the website over the past year. The previous year was 1.1 million, and we increased by nearly a quarter of a million this year, and we're going to increase next year. So when we, when we place an ad in the journal, when we place the ebook version of the journal on the website, you will, hundreds of thousands of people will eventually see your ads in the book. So. Um, if you would like to place an ad, you can do so immediately. You can do so tonight. You can do so right now. As a matter of fact, when you go to the Who Do Mind page, a one-fourth page ad is $25. A one-half page ad is $35. And a full page ad is $50. And the size of the journal is 8.5 by 11, like a magazine size. So a full page ad is a, you know, a full magazine size page ad. So it's $25, $35, or $50 for a full-page ad. And you can do that directly on the Who Do Mind page um, on our website. Right now, you'll see the um, information about the journal. You'll see the front cover talking about the journal. And you'll see your PayPal. There's a drop-down menu. We also have a few more spaces for vendors. So if you would like to vend, you have some cultural products that are in alignment with our ancestral cultural values. Um, you will see the vendor registration application right there on the website as well. Um, we provide the six-foot table for you and a couple of chairs. Um, the vending fee for the, for the day is $25 for a table. So you can go directly to the website now. Um, so this is, the, this is as far as the journal, this is the last day to get those JPEG files in, the images in that you would like to see um, placed in the journal. So just go to the page now. You can uh, decide which size of an ad you would like, and then email us that JPEG file so we can begin. We need to begin formatting so that we can get ready for the printing so we, we can make sure that we have the books ready um, well enough ahead of time and also to you know, account for possible delays in printing or shipping of ink and so forth because we do the printing ourselves. So. Um, another piece with regard to the Who Do Mind Festival logistically, a couple of the presenters we're trying to bring in, so we need to help to cover expenses for a couple of our presenters talking about natural health and medicine and so forth. So we would like, whether you would like to place an ad in the journal or vending and so forth, but placing an ad in the journal that assists us in printing the journal out, but it also will contribute uh, percentage-wise towards helping to bring our presenters from out of state to come in because, of course, this is a free um, event 
and we don't charge people to come to our events. And even when we go out of out of state to speak or wherever we speak, we don't charge an admissions fee for our presentation. So this will help with the expenses to bring the sisters out who will be speaking at the event. Also, if you would like to make a donation, you can do so on our Nhoma page, or you can do so on the Hudu Mind page as well. And we'll put that link in the chat room right now. And we just put the link in there, the Hudu Mind page. So whether you make a donation, a purchase of one or more of our books, our publications, that will assist us um, with regards to the expenses for the event, including helping to bring some of our, a couple of our presenters out so they can speak to the community, because they're doing this for free. So, um, and we'll get back, we'll talk about that information more in detail. So the first thing we want to do, we want to talk about Ocom economic development. When you go to the Ocom economic development model, we're going to look at a portion of that because we want to talk about the nature of this kind of institution. A festival is not only something where people have fun and so forth, but it is a cultural institution. It is part of ritually reaffirming our ancestral values to keep us in harmony with divine order as a community, as an Oman, as an Afurakani Afurakani nation. So when we look at a festival as an entity, an instrument to align us spiritually, a cultural institution, then it's a totally different perspective. It's a proper perspective, a holistic perspective. The Omain is a nation. The Omain, the community, the nation itself is a living entity. The cultural institutions within the Omain are similar to organs within the body. These cultural institutions are entities, living entities within themselves. So let's look at the nation, the nature of Okom, and we're talking about Okom economic development, and we'll show how it's connected to this no notion of the Omain, the nation, as well as Amain Sesu nation building restoration. So we talk about, and this is from the Okom economic development model that we published, and we put the link in the chat room. Now, hold on one second. Okay, so in the Akan language, the term Okom means hunger or want of something. This term is related to Akom, referencing spirit possession, as well as Nkom, referencing spirit communication. These terms have their roots in our ancestral language of ancient Kanit and Kemet, Nubia and Egypt, where we find Kom meaning to embrace, to possess, to seize, become possessed by a deity. And we show the Medutu, the so-called hieroglyphs for the term Kom. You find in Akan, Okom means possession. Kom in ancient Kemet, in the Medutu, the hieroglyph means possession. Okay, so the term Akom is comprised of the terms Ko, which means to go, and Mu, which means within. Komu, komu, or kom means to go within. Thus, komu or kom, a kom, going within, references hunger, desire for the going within, or consumption, possession of food and medicine for sustenance, healing, building, and protection. That's on the physical side. As well as the spirit of an abosom, dead the spirit of an Osamai, an ancestor spirit, going within, komu or kom, komu, go within, going within or possessing the individual for spiritual sustenance, healing, building, and protection. This is also why kom mere means, is a term for the throat. It's the space or place mere of kom what that which is possessed or consumed is taken in, that which goes within, which is the food. So the throat is the calm mede or the calm place, the possession place. That is the place where food goes within. Just like food goes within that place, then you also have unkom bere, which is a term that we utilize for an ancestral shrine. It's the place bere where unkom communication, spiritual communication, going in, takes place. So, 
the spirit of an abosom, the spirit of an osamine, a deity or an ancestral spirit going within komu or kom, or possessing the individual for spiritual sustenance, healing, building, and protection. So when you consume food and so forth, it is for food or medicine, for your sustenance, healing, building, and protection. When spirit possession takes place, the spirit goes within. It's for spiritual sustenance, spiritual healing, spiritual building, and spiritual protection. In a natural sense, Okom references our innate inclination to possess Okom, that which we need to sustain ourselves, heal ourselves, protect ourselves, develop ourselves, govern ourselves, shelter ourselves, and clothe ourselves. So we have a natural inclination to possess, to take control, you know, grasp, to take control of and utilize, possess that which we need to sustain ourselves, food and so forth, heal ourselves, medicine, protect ourselves, develop ourselves, govern ourselves, shelter ourselves, and clothe ourselves. This distillation of seven needs resounds the seven principal values of Amain Sesu, or nation building. Restoration for Afurakani, Afurakani people as delineated with, within Akwamu Main, Amaruka, Hetifi Mudi, Akwamu Nation in North America, when we published the Oberima Afurakani Manhood book, we laid out the seven principal values of Amain Sesu, a nation builder, not just food, clothing, and shelter, and security. Seven principal values rooted, rooted in this constellation of seven needs governed by the abosom, the deities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which animate our seven-day week and also our seven-day chronobiological cycle called the surface septum cycle. So this is a holistic set of values rooted in the divinities that govern all natural cycles on Earth, that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which govern our seven-day week, week, which is a natural cycle influencing the Earth in a holistic fashion every seven days renewing our physiological processes in that circa septin, seven-day chronobiological cycle. And the divinity who govern all natural cycles, constellation of seven um, solar, lunar, and planetary bodies through which the abosom operate, when they participate in and empower and give birth to these seven principal values of Amain Sesu, or nation building, you know you have a set of seven principal values that are governed by the actual forces in nature. Therefore, it is a holistic set of values dealing with nation building. The seven principal values of nation building, restoration, number one, we must have methods of food production and preservation. If you want to have a nation become independent, self-governing, self-ruling on your own land and so forth, you must have methods of food production and preservation. You must be able to feed yourself, feed the community, of course. You can't have a nation if you cannot feed yourself and you're dependent on your enemies to feed you. Second principle value, you must have methods of curing disease. You must be able to feed yourself, but you must be able to heal yourself, cure diseases, diseases, serious acute disorders as well as minor, you know, diseases and so forth. We must be able to cure ourselves. We can't be dependent on our enemies to heal us or cure us. It's not natural to not, to, to not be able to understand how to extract medicine from plant life, mineral life, and so forth, and restore balance in the physical body and spiritually where imbalance is manifest. So we must have methods of curing disease. Somebody can't just get a virus and then the whole nation suffers and dies because somebody couldn't cure a viral infection, a basic viral infection. It wouldn't matter that you had land and chartered land from an Afurakani, Afurakani nation. They carved out some land for us and we migrated there and we were able to feed ourselves and produce our food and preserve our food and so forth. And then somebody gets a, a basic cold or a little virus and everybody dies in a year. That's nonsense and irresponsible. So we must have methods of curing disease, of course, rooted in our ancestral culture. The third principal value of nation building is establishing a military structure. We must be able to defend ourselves because we know anything that we establish by their ill nature and volition, the whites and their offspring will seek to destroy it. So knowing that 
anytime you establish anything, at the same time you establish an immune system. In the same fashion as we talked about in our previous broadcast, when Odomankoma, the finisher of creation, brought into being the first principal agents of creation, in our Khan culture it says, Obo Essein, Obo Ocherima, Obo Obrafo, First, the messenger, the divine messenger communicator of the universe is brought into being the divine nervous system within the great divine body of the supreme being. Secondly, the ocherema, the divine drummer, regulator of order and energy in creation. That divine drummer in your body, of course, is the heart and the cardiovascular system. That's the next, next system that comes into being. And then the third is the obrafo titere, the great obrafo the head or chief executioner, divine killer, enforcer of divine order and enforceress of divine order. That is the immune system, lymphatic system. That is the system of defense. So the third principle value is establishing a military structure. We understand the white scenarios frame of cancerous cells within the great divine body. They will seek only to consume and destroy. It doesn't matter that we migrate if we migrate it or repatriated to the continent, that we're leaving America to leave the white scenario spring, to reestablish our own society independently and working on our, all by ourselves. These crackers will seek a way to get over there and figure out a way to try to destroy everything that we have built because they are parasitic spirits of disorder, all of them without exception. Europeans, Asians, Hindus, pseudo-Native Americans, white Hispanics, white Americans, white Latinos, and so forth, all of them, without exception, living and deceased. So we must establish a military structure. The fourth principal value is establishing institutions of education, training, and cultivation. We must institutionalize our values. We must establish institutions of training so we can teach food production and preservation, so we can teach curing disease, so we can teach military science, so we can teach production of clothing. So we can teach uh, sound systems of, of governance and jurisprudence and so forth and engineering and everything we need to, to sustain ourselves. Institutions, training institutions, educational institutions, cultivating institutions, and that includes ancestral religious institutions to cultivate the people every moment of every day so that we know how to function in the world, how we align with our divine function. The decisions you make Determine the direction of your life. If you make self-destructive decisions, it doesn't matter that you have systems in place. It doesn't matter if you have institutions such as training institutions and so forth in place. If you do not know how to behave because you do not know what your divine function is because you don't know the nature of your crop, your crop while your soul, your divine consciousness, you don't know what your divine function as a cell within the great divine body of the supreme being is, what forces in nature govern you and how these natural inclinations that you have towards certain things, objects, deeds, and entities, and these natural repulsions you have from certain things, objects, deeds, and entities, if you cannot contextualize these innate inclinations and learn how to align with that divinity within you, then you engage in self-destructive activity, and you're led into self-destructive activity, which is not good for you, self-destructive for you, but also to those who are connected to you, which is all of us, which is the Omar. So institutions of spiritual cultivation is key. And, of course, Hudu Mind, the Hudu Nation Festival, is one of these institutions of spiritual cultivation, cultivating every member of the O-Mind so we can work in harmony with one another without creating a great deal of conflict. It doesn't matter if someone is an agriculturalist and has that skill or someone can cure disease and they have that skill or someone is an engineer and they have that skill, or someone deals with textiles and manufactures clothing and they have that skill, if they don't know how to interact with one another in a harmonious fashion and see value in each member of the Afurakani Afurakaiti nation because they can see what divinity governs the person, every person, and recognizes their interdependent relationship with one another, if they can't see that, then they will seek to exploit and engage in self-destructive activity, exploiting themselves and others as well. So spiritual cultivation is key to the maintenance of civilization. Civilization is a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. That's what a civilization is. 
This is why we have, are the only ones who have established civilization. The whites and their offspring have established society, social grouping. We have established civilization, a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. And the only way you can establish a social order rooted in the divine order of creation is when you can align with the forces in nature that animate creation, the spirits that animate the sun, animate the moon, animate the planets, animate the black substance of space, animate the earth mother, animate the oceans, animate the rivers, animate the atmosphere, animate the thunder and lightning and fire. You can, all these forces that we are impacted by and surround and move through us, the magnetosphere of earth and so forth, if you can align with the spirits that animate all of creation, then you can align yourself with the order that's manifest in creation every moment of every day. You can replicate that order when you establish a society. If you cannot attune to the forces of nature, just like the white and our spring cannot, then they cannot replicate a divine order that they cannot align with. But we can. So when we establish a social order rooted in the divine order of creation, we have established a civilization because we align and become possessed by and communicate with the abosom, the forces in nature, and are informed and reinforced by our nananum insulamfo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. So Hudu Mind, the Hudu Nation Festival, is one of these institutions, one of these cultural institutions, institutions of cultivation, key to our mind sesu or nation building. It is the white snarl frame who will tell us, and through their brainwashed proxies in our community, we don't need to focus on culture, we just need to focus on economics. We don't need to focus on culture, we just need to focus on defense. We don't need to focus on culture, we just need to focus on government. And you know, civil government and so forth. We don't need to focus on, you know, culture. We just need to focus on engineering and science. These are idiots, brainwashed Negroes who believe that they know what they're talking about. However, they still worship the whites and their offspring and their approach to life. Culture is key. Culture simply means way of life. What is our means by which we will engage the process of agricultural activity? What is our means by which we engage the curing of disease? What is our means by which we establish a military structure? What is our means by which we engage in sound systems of governance and jurisprudence and so forth? We have a specific means by which we must do these things. We must have, we have a culture. And our culture, our amandre, is animated by our ancestral religion, our relationship to the forces in nature and, of course, the supreme being. If you don't have that, you just have a bunch of skilled individuals who are self-destructive imitators of the white snare offspring. And this is the point that we find ourselves in. And we have reestablished culture, we reestablished order, and then we can pull all of these disparate elements of nation building restoration together. Culture animated by ancestral religion is the, the key to all of that. And this is precisely why the white snare offspring tried to convince us that culture and our ancestral religion is a waste of time and the brainwashed proxies in our community Eight, that nonsense. The fifth principle value of Amain Tetsu nation building, restoration, is establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence. So you have some land, you're feeding yourself, curing disease, defending the land with a military structure, establishing institutions, but if you can't govern yourself, if you don't have sound systems of jurisprudence, then minor infractions between one or more people who are grouped within the collective become a great conflagration. Internecine warfare can jump off because we don't have sound systems of jurisprudence, a means by which we can redress grievances, mitigate dispute. We need to understand that governance, which is rooted in an ancestral model, based on the way the abosom governed creation, we reestablish a system of governance that reflects that, and then we can govern ourselves in a harmonious way. The sixth principal value of Amain Sesu nation building is the construction of homes, of course, on acquired land. So we acquire that access to that ancestral land, and then we engage in engineering the building of homes, shelter, and so forth, as well as physical edifices for our institution. The final principal value of nation building, seventh, is the production, of course, of clothing and manufacturing of textiles and so forth. So these various seven principal values they reflect that constellation of seven 
need. We have a need to sustain ourselves, need to heal ourselves, a need to protect ourselves, develop ourselves, govern ourselves, shelter ourselves, and clothe ourselves. Those, that constellation of seven needs is reflected in this, these seven principal values of nation building, and these seven principal values are governed by the Abosom who govern the seven days of the week. So that's key. Our innate inclination manifests as a home that hunger for possession directs us to address these needs in harmony with Nyamewa Nyame in Sheshe, the mother and father supreme beings, order the divine order. And as we said, they're governed by Siabosum, they govern the seven days of the week. As we fully embrace our collective identity as Afurakani Afurakani people, we have our own individual functions, like individual cells have their own specific functions in the body but at the same time, they are interdependent upon the other cells within the organ or organ system. We have an individual identity, but then we're also part of collective identity as Afurakani, Afurakani people. And when we fully embrace our collective identity as Afurakani, Afurakani people, we naturally recognize and embrace our collective function as a group of people separate and distinct from non-Afurakani, non-Afurakani, non-African, non-Black individuals. And group. And of course, that includes, includes, of course, the whites and their offspring. We are distinct physically and spiritually from all non black people and have absolutely no common nor collective function with them, just as healthy cells in the body have no common nor collective function with cancerous cells that exist within the same body. Cancerous cells have a temporal existence under normal natural circumstances and are ultimately eradicated, while the healthy cells are the foundation for the perpetuity of the physical body. So we understand that. So it's key to understand when we have that proper perspective, that ancestral religious festival, just like the Opet festival in ancient Kemet, or the Sed festival in ancient Kemet, or the Heb festival in ancient Kemet, and so forth, and the various festivals we have, like we have the Akho, Afashe, and Akan culture of 13 days observance around the spring equinox and so forth. And then we have our seven-day New Year observance in September around the autumn, Atemet equinox and so forth. And we have ritual days throughout the course of the year, time that we take out to realign ourselves, reconstitute ourselves, rejuvenate ourselves, and realign ourselves with divine order, individually and collectively family, communally, and so forth. That's key. That's key to understand that these festivals, these operations, these cultural institutions are part of the fabric of the community. They pull the community together so we can get on the same page and maintain divine order within ourselves individually and interdependently. That's the function of these festivals. That's the function of these cultural institutions. So it's not just about dressing up and pretending like somebody is Afurakani, Afurakani. It's about aligning ourselves with divine order on a communal level. Just like your cells function together in the, in the heart or in the spleen, in the pancreas and so forth, and they're constantly being cleansed by the water moving throughout the system and constantly being energized by the energy moving through the blood that's moving throughout the system. They're being cleansed and energized and empowered. When we engage in these ritual practices, these cultural institutions, we are being cleansed, and then we are being empowered, energized, rejuvenated, and so forth, so we can move forward in a harmonious fashion. There's a spiritual, cosmological foundation for engaging these communal rituals and festivals and so forth. So we want to get that information in. So before we go to this next piece, if you have a question or a comment on the phone line, hit the number one. If you would like to interact in the chat room, you, remember you must log in as a user um, in order to log in and, and communicate in the chat room. All right. So we're going to go to this link, and we'll put the link back in the chat room right quick. Okay. And so the link is for our so the specific the Who Do Mind page. Just so you can see that page for the individuals who have not seen that yet, and we'll put the link back in here right quick. 
you'll see um, what you'll see is the, the front page of the flyer. you see the three-page flyer. Of course, you can download that PDF and you can share that. But you'll see that image that you see, and the reason we use this image, one of the mountain ranges in ancient Kana, in ancient Nubia. Next to that, you see images of blood platelets. Then you see Nana Kwame Afrane, which is George Washington Carver, a great healer and so forth, and agriculturalist. And then you see Nana Abena Aramita, Harriet Tubman, a warrioress, a Khan ancestress, um, waging war against the whites and our spring, freeing our people and so forth. Ancestress, one of our honored Nana Nom Nsamanso, just like Nana Kwame Afrane, one of our Nana Nom Nsamanso honored elders and elders and so forth. And we utilize them in connection with that image of the blood, the moja, in connection with ancient Kana. We utilize this image for our specific broadcast talking about Ka and Kaet, which is, means a, a mountain range, it means soil and so forth. But then Ka and Kaet also means soul. So the name of that particular broadcast for us from soil to soul. Ka and Kaet means soil, talking about the landmass, but Ka and Kaet also means soul. So we talked about from soil to soul. Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, ancestral religion carried within the blood circle. So we talk about how we inherit our ancestral religious practices through our blood circle. The first people fashioned from the soil of Apuraka, Apuraikaita, our bodies coming from that sacred. Ka and Kaya is the divine highland of Apura Ka, Apura Ka, meaning the land, Ka Kaya of Apura and Apura, the creator and creatress, Apura Ka, the land, Ka of Apura, the land of the creator, Apura Ka, the land, Ka of Apura, the creatress. And of course, we have our book, Apura Ka, Apura Ka, the origin of the term Africa, where we prove that conclusively in the Medutu. So from soil to soul. You know, our bodies are fashioned with the original ka and kaya, the original landmass, and then the spirit it takes up residence in the body. And inside the spirit, we are given a soul, a ka and kaya. And then we transmit not only our DNA to our descendants, but we also transmit our spiritual disposition, the spiritual energy, the patriclan divinities, matriclan divinities that are connected to our blood circles intergenerationally and transcarnationally coming from the soil to the soul, is constantly transmitted. The energy within the earth mother is also woven into our physiological uh, structure, our DNA, the mitochondrial DNA from the mother, the Y chromosomal DNA from the father. The energy of the earth mother is woven into that because the energy of the earth mother is woven into that and we can connect with her spirit. We can stimulate and trigger that energy within our physical body, within our quote-unquote DNA or the moja and the Ntoro, as we would say, in the Akan tradition. So we've carried that intergenerationally wherever we have been to migrate in the Western Hemisphere. As long as we have the blood of our ancestresses and ancestors, it is a magnet for the spirit of our ancestresses and ancestors. As long as we have the blood connected to the abosom, then we are magnets for the spirit of the abosom, and they will possess us wherever we are forced to migrate in the world. They continue to engage in spirit possession here in North America. We get possessed by the Arbosome. They heal, they teach, they guide, and show us how to wage war against the white narrow spring through chemical and biological warfare as well as physical warfare. We freed ourselves from enslavement, freed our brothers and sisters, established independent nations, and wage war against the white narrow spring until we made them submit to emancipation and abolition from soil to soul. Ka, kaet, to ka, kaet. Afurakani, Afurakani, the ancestral religion in the blood. So this is why we utilize that image. It is a teaching in and of itself. And so we talk about on the flyer, um, the vendors and so forth, and we, how we're going to have the whole vending piece. And then we talk about briefly our presentation. And our presentation will be based on Kudu, which is the Akan tradition in North America. Many people know that Vodou comes from the Fon and Efe people. And voodoo means deity. So when you talk about New Orleans voodoo, Louisiana voodoo, and voodoo across the southern and southeastern United States and so forth, 
people know, oh, that was a phone term in the phone, and Hebe people were forced onto these shores. They kept speaking their language, and they would say voodoo when they're talking about their tradition. Later on, the white snarl spring would utilize the term voodoo or voodoo in a negative way and try to give it a negative connotation because they're criminals, they're perverts, parasites. No definition they give it stick, but they would try to utilize that and brainwash black people, utilize it in a negative fashion. But they also began to utilize it as a generic term, just meaning African religion or something negative. But originally, the term voodoo and its specific practice was carried by phone and ebe speaking people into the Western Hemisphere. In the same fashion, many people do not know until we published our book, first our article and then we included that article in a larger book, that in the same fashion, the Akan people brought hoodoo to North America. The term hoodoo is an Akan term. Of course, when people say you practice hoodoo, that means uh, root work, root medicine, root doctors, and so forth. It also means conjure. So sometimes they just call the tradition root work, or they call the tradition conjure. They practice conjure or they practice root work. They'll say that's what the definition of hoodoo is. Why do they say that? It's because that's exactly what the term means. The whites in our spring will lie about the term and say it comes from hoodio or judio or Judaism, which is idiotic, or say it's an Irish term, which is perverse. They're straight liars, of course. We have proven conclusively and irrefutably that hoodoo comes from the Akan term undu. Undu means medicine, specifically medicine from roots, trees, stalks, and so forth. Root medicine, undu, yefo, is the individuals, the group of individuals, fo, who work, ye, undu, medicine from roots, trees, and so forth. The undu yefo or undu yefo is literally the root worker, root doctor. Person also is called the Udumafo. Undu means medicine, root medicine, and so forth. It also means to conjure, and ma means to give. Unduma people are the Unduma people, the ones who are engaged in Undu. Unduma becomes Huduman, Huduman, and Huduwum. The priests and priestesses, the healers and healeresses, the conjurers, the conjuresses, and so forth. This is what it means. So that comes directly from our language and our cosmology. We prove in our book that not only does it come from the Akan language, those exact same terms can be found in the language of ancient Kemet and Kani. So if we look in our book, Who Do People, we show this direct inheritance. When Akan people were forced into the Western Hemisphere, we continue to use our terms. We continue to say, Who Do, doing with root work, root medicine, conjure, and so forth, and maintained our traditions up until this very day. And we go into detail about that in the book. So on one of the pages in the book near the end, we show a chart. After we explain all these terms, show them in the Akan dictionaries and so forth, in the culture, co in context, and then showing the exact same terms in the language of ancient Kemet, in the Medusu, in the hieroglyph, with the exact same meaning, and then, which just brings a uh, fine point to the reality that it is the same culture. And of course, in other publications, we have shown the exact same deities from ancient Kemet, Amen, Amenet, Ra, Raet, Atem, Kepra, Asase, Nebet, Hetepet, Asase, Nebet, Pet, Osar, Oset, Set, Nebet, Het, Heru, Wachet, Nekebet, all the various divinities worshipped in ancient Kanit and Kemet are still worshipped in the Akan language by the same names with the same function in creation today. And we've proved that through a number of books. So if we look at this chart, real quick on page 21 of the book, we have one column with the Akan term, the other column with the terms from ancient Kemet and Kani, Egypt and Nubia. Undu and Akan, also pronounced Nduru. So the Nduru in the Asante dialect, Ndu in the Akwamu dialect. So you have both versions, Ndu meaning medicine and Akan. Then you look in the column for ancient Kemet and Kani, Ndunu, and Ndun means medicine. Go back to the Akan column, Ndua, well, Ndria means trees, plants, root. In ancient Kemet and Kani, Ndu means trees, plants, and root. In Akan, Du, and the other version, Duru, means heavy, heaviness, a weight, meaning a heavy weight. 
in ancient Kemet and Kanat, Undunu means heavy, heaviness, a weight. And we show the hieroglyphs, the Medutu, for all of it. In the Akan language, Du, as well as Duru, means to descend, to come down upon, like a spirit descending and coming down upon someone to possess someone. In ancient Kemet, Udu means to cause, to come down. Magical formulae, talking about Kanji. In Akan, Ndu, as well as Nduru, means ritual medicine, offering. In ancient Kemet and Kani, Ndu and Nduru means ritual offering. It also means shrine. In Akan, Aduru, She means embalming. In ancient Kemet, Udu, as well as Udu, She means embalming and the deity of embalming. In Akan, Oduyefo means the spirit conjurer, medicine, embalming. In ancient Kemet, Udiu means embalmer, communicator with the deceased, meaning conjuring the spirit of the deceased to communicate. The Oduyefo, the group of people fall who engage in Oduye, Ye means to work or to make. So Udu, medicine, Udu, conjure, to make. Ye ndu medicine or to make ye ndu conjuring. Udu ye for is the red medicine making or the conjuring making person. The conjuring working person, the medicine working person. Udu sao means ritual incantation, conjuring in ancient Kemet. Udun sini fo means the medicine person, the healer. Udunu and undunu means the deity. It also is an assistant of Tehuti. Also, a group of deities, Undu or Unduru deity in ancient Kemet. In North America, Hoodoo people, so called African Americans, the land of Hoodoo is the south, the southern United States, and so forth. In ancient Kemet, one of the titles of Nubia, the southern land, Undu and Unduru. The south land, the land of ancient Kemet, Kanit, Nubia, Sudan. And we show the Medutu for that. And then the people are called the Unduru people, and the land the Unduru land, a district of Sudan and a region of Sudan. So all of those, that entire list, and of course there is more showing the direct identity of the language, the ritual practices, the names, even of deities, as well as the people. We're talking about the exact same culture. So we, when we do our presentation, we're going to go into detail about that, and as well as um, when we talk about the Ndu, Akwaba, the Hudu doll baby, we did an article called the Ndu Akwaba, the Hudu doll baby. And what we have done with that, we were able to acquire an Akwaba doll, the so-called fertility doll that you see that looks like an ox that's all over the continent and people sell them and so forth. The large ovular head with the two little arms sticking straight out and the straight body. It looks like an ox because it is an ox. Of course, we did our, our, our publication talking about the Abosom, the deity goddess Akua, who is never had an ancient Kemet. She never had an Akan culture, Akua as well. She, that Ankh is her talisman, and it is the Akua, or Unkwa. Unkwa means life in Akan. Ankh or Anku in ancient Kemet means life. And of course, that same doll is the Ankh. So people know about that. It's called the Akuaba. Akua means, he's talking about that divinity. Um, ba also means child, but Aku is also referencing that talisman, which is in the form of a doll. So Akua Ba also means doll, Akua Ba, child, or doll, child, doll, baby. This is why in Hudu, you have the Hudu doll baby, where medicine is attached to the doll baby and utilized for ritual practice. In the same fashion, the Akua Ba doll, Akua, child, Doll, child, or doll, baby is utilized, and medicine is utilized to help women become fertile, also for funerary practices, but also for conjuring, also placed in the shrines of the deity, the abosom, also for the nananum and samako, the ancestresses and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated. We show that in this article because we were able to acquire an akuaba that was found in America in the 1700s in Virginia carved by the hands of one of our Akan ancestors who were forced, who was forced into enslavement. We were able to find that Akuaba 
one of our Nanano Mpanyipo acquired it from that auction house. They, they said they found an African-American slave doll, and they called it African-American folk art. They did not know what they were looking at. As soon as we saw it, of course, we knew exactly what we were looking at. So we were able to acquire that doll, and therefore we were able to bring that back into the Ojira mind, the purified nation of Apurakani, Apurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, our collective group, Apurakani, Apurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. As a collective, that's who we are. We utilize the term Jira mind because Jira means purification. Omind means nation, but it also means West, land of the setting sun and Nechi Kemet. So we are the purified Jira mind nation in the land of the setting sun, mind the West, O Jira mind. We've died and resurrected to the culture, purified just like Osar, just like Osset, returning to her throne and so forth the purified nation of people in the Western Hemisphere, Afurakani, Afurakani people, instead of using the term diaspora. So we were able to reclaim one of our ancestral shrines, forged and carved by the hands of one of our direct blood, Akan ancestors and ancestors. We did a broadcast on that. We did an article on that. Um, we, of course, we had that ancestral Akuaba at our ancestral um, New Year celebration on the, September 19th, and the community came out was able to see that aqua, that carving and so forth on our shrine that we had for the celebration and so forth. So we talk about all of that in the article, and you'll see the image of that on the flyer. Um, when you look at the flyer, you'll not only see it on the second page, but the backdrop of the flyer. When you see the, the watermark of the flyer, that is her. That is that ancestral aqua that was carved in the 1700s that we now have at our shrine and will be in our center when we open up our center and be in, on the shrine at the center, our educational institution, our Kongwa Suya Dan. So this is what we're dealing with. Um, we see we have a call. Let's, let's go to the call real quick on the phone before we move forward. Okay, me Chiobo on the phone line, number 9602. You had a question or a comment? Yes, I do have a question or a comment. I came in late, um, but... I'm in a situation where I do see um, our males being attacked from all levels. And I know that it it has something to do with voodoo. And I'm trying to figure out how do I eliminate the dark forces that come against um, my children, in particular my youngest son. I... I I offer offerings to my ancestors. I try to um, keep my house and put my house in order and, you know, just protect my environment. But I'm still seeing where they are falling prey to some of these things. Now, now, when you say they're falling prey to some of these things, you mean influences from other people, or what? What do you feel like influence from other people? Um, the environment in which they have to operate. I have my my youngest son. Definitely, he's the major one that has been falling to the influence, and he's been succumbing to it. He doesn't believe anything that I say. Even though I speak to him and I warn him, he will walk right dead into it. And I'm trying to to not only protect him but also wisen him up so that he would be able to recognize these things and, you know, guard himself. Okay. Now, will he, will he and very often the children won't always, you know, on the surface listen to what their mothers say or young male would think, feel like they know what they're doing and so forth and they, can, they got this handle and everything, even though internally as we're – you know, adolescents and teenagers, we are really listening, even though externally we don't want to appear that we are listening. But we do remember, we do, you know, we do internalize what's being said. Some people do it a little bit later and let it express it a little bit later. Some people express it earlier on. But will we listen mm-hmm. to anybody else outside of you, even though you'll tell them a certain specific thing, it's like he rejects it. Somebody else mm-hmm. comes along and says the exact same thing, and it's like a revelation like nobody ever said it. Is he kind of like that? Does he listen to other mm-hmm. people outside of what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So, and and that's, you know, 
that that is very common. So one thing I would say, we and, and of course this is a, a free one of our free downloads. We publish a book, Oberima Afurakani Manhood, Seven Principal Values of Manhood. It's a manual for Afurakani young men as well as older men, just Afurakani males, period. So you can download that particular book, the Oberima Afurakani Manhood. This is coming from a male, coming from somebody outside the house. You know, maybe he'll listen to somebody else. If you get the book, purchase it, or, or you don't even have to purchase it. You can download the whole thing for free. Um, you can share that with them. We also did a broadcast on it where we went into detail about it. And when, sometimes when a male is listening to somebody and, feel, and they feel like they've taken it upon themselves to investigate something, like somebody's not telling them this is what you need to know or trying to tell them, or they feel like they would characterize it as nagging them. If they feel like they got the information and they're doing it on their own, then they're, they're more open to, you know, incorporating that information. So on one hand, you can definitely go to our Oberima page on our website, download the book, mm -hmm. um, the entire thing. Um, if you want the soft cover version, you can get that as well. We do have the soft cover version. It's like uh, $9 or something like that. Um, you can, and you can also, you know, sh show the link to the video where we go into detail going through the entire book. On the spiritual okay. side, like you said, you were doing, you know, ritual with regard to your insamanfo. Now, while he's doing his thing, of course, you're going to your insamanfo to get them to work on him. Your ancestors and ancestors are his as well. So what kind of work are you doing with your insamanfo? Like when you go to your ancestral shrine, what kind of... I'm trying, to, to, I'm trying to clear the energy. I'm trying to um, clean the environment. I'm trying to... Um, protect us and give each member in the house clarity of mind and spirit and have them become open and um, receptive to what is going on because they they tend to walk through everything blindly and I end up carrying the weight of everyone. And, you know, it, it becomes overwhelming many times. And okay. it's it's like just when I get to the place where I know that okay, I have cleared I have cleared the environment, I have guarded my 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 home, I have um reached a point of clarity, one of them would slip or find themselves in a situation that just allows it to start all over again. So it's a repetitive cycle. Because there's now, a lot of rebellion. About, okay. A lot of now, rebellion. When you're, talking about, when you're talking about cleansing, you're talking about ritually cleansing the home, ritually cleansing the, the yes. room, yes. And so forth, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, once once you do the cleansing, when you go to the, what is your process, and you don't have to, you know, give details, but just like in general. I smudge. So, I smudge. I burn frankincense and myrrh. I wash my floors, um, you know, I wash their blankets, I use sea salt, uh, I pray, I meditate. Okay. I pray that's, over that's them. What I, want to get to. I want to ask about that. So once you do the cleansing and all of that is good, everything you're doing with regard to that is, you know, on point. So then once you go to the... In Samantha, go to the ancestors and ancestors. What is your process like then? And uh, the reason I'm asking the question is because there are different ways that um, people have been shown. Like sometimes I've come in contact with say, people who have been involved in the Yoruba tradition or even the yeah, Akan tradition sometimes or Bodun or something like that. Depending on who they were connected with, they may cleanse themselves, cleanse the area. Then they go to their shrine and they do whatever ritual prayer or invocation that they learn to evoke their ancestors and ancestors, and they once they evoke them through maybe a ritual song or a chant or a ritual prayer or something like that, or mm -hmm. and then give them some food, some kind of offering, and you know that's that's their ritual. Now, what we do that's calling them. That's uh, that's no different than getting on the phone and dialing the numbers, and once the connection is made and they hear you and you speak and say, hey, can you come over? And they say, oh, yes, 
I can come over. You just call them in, and then they come to the house and ring the doorbell, and then you open up the door, and they come and sit down. All of the, the ritual invocation or provocation are to call the Nsamampo to come and take up residence at the shrine so you can engage them. But once they are there and say you give them food, give offerings, no different than somebody coming to your house and you give them some food once they sit down, and then they eat. But after they eat, you don't end the session and then leave. That's when you sit down and begin to listen and ask specific questions about what's going on, um, what's, what's causing the disorder, and then ask for specific, you know, remedies for that. And then also ask about the specific means by which they're trying to inform you. Sometimes they will inform you directly at the shop. Sometimes they'll inform you through dreams. Sometimes they'll inform you through specific signs, through specific, as we call it, achinebois, animal totems. You'll see crows showing up at specific times, at specific junctures, in, un, unusually in certain ways, or you'll see uh, specific cat animal totems, or, you, you know, certain things that they will keep showing you or putting you in the position to come in contact with, letting you know that they're every step of the way they're trying to inform you about some situation. So they communicate with us in various different ways. But the key is first finding out what's in harmony with order, where are we off track. If, if you know, if you are off track, if you're making any kind of, you know, if there's something you may have been procrastinating upon, maybe they directed you to do a certain thing, certain kind of individual cleansing or so forth, whether it's physiological, dietary-wise, um, consumption-wise, or spiritual-wise, anything that you are missing, have you been allowing, for example, one of the ways that the pores in your spirit body can open up wide and it becomes porous is through a lack of vitality on one hand physically. You need to get enough sleep and strengthen yourself physically and the right diet and everything else, but also um, spiritually when you allow fear or misguided desire to control you to a certain extent. When you allow fear to grip you, it's no different physically. If somebody allows fear, like, for example, if somebody has, somebody's scared of spiders, for example, and somebody knows that, so they get a big rubber spider with a string and they turn off the light and somebody comes home and they open up the door, they see the rubber spider and the person pulls the string and it pulls it across the floor and the person gets scared. So right. all of a sudden, because of their fear of spiders, it's a false belief because it's not a real spider and it can't do anything to them. But because they're fearful, then that they transfer that emotional energy reaction to constricting their nerves around their muscles and create tension and headaches and that, uh, you know, a shot of adrenaline and their heart starts pumping and they become, become weak. In the same fashion, we can cause that kind of um, negative reaction in our spirit body. So if we have some fear or consternation about something, mm -hmm. uh, something that's been, you know, uh, basically programmed into us that we have not broken yet, the insamanko help us to break through that fear when we align with our crop. But if we allow that to control us, then we become stressed, and then that weakens our immunity, no different than somebody, you know, taking a shower and running outside with the pores open and their immunity is compromised. Fear okay. manifests as energetic, um, like energetic, quote-unquote, stress or constriction, and then it causes your, your aura to become porous, and now you can receive things that normally your body would reject. When somebody runs outside and their pores are open, normally their immune system just knocks out microbes day in and day out without them thinking about it, like a tennis match just knocking the ball across the, you know, net. But if you open yourself up by taking a shower and running outside, then the microbes that normally get knocked out and crushed, then they just assault you and, and you know, dominate you. And the same thing if you allow fear which is a negative energy manifestation, to control mm -hmm. you, then you open up pores in your spirit body, and now the things, the discarnate entities and negative projections of negative people and so forth that normally will bounce right off of you because you have that magnetic field that's repelling them all the time, just like a magnet repelling another one across the table. Now you mm -hmm. become pores, and then those things can get in. And once they get in, they cause, you know, stress. They cause physiological stress, vision, 
and the slightest bad decision has a you know uh, an effect. It has a you know, domino effect that can affect the children, affect the people you're working with, affect the people around you, and so forth. But when you get with the insomnia after you call them, the key is what is in harmony with order. What am I doing that I may have overlooked because of programming or or because of fear or whatever, and asking them to help you you know overcome that fear. Okay. And and the same thing with your own crop. Um, we did we did a couple of detailed broadcasts on that and overcoming the negative effects of that negative energy. So um, if you send me an email, I'll give you the direct link to those broadcasts. Okay. Okay. Are these your YouTube broadcasts? Um, yes. We well, all of them were done on Blog Talk, but then we saved some of them also to YouTube. So they exist all on the Blog Talk channel, but also some of them are on YouTube as well. So what you're saying is even though I see negative things that could that that will create anxiety and fear within me, it's how I perceive the negativity that makes it continue. It's not now it's not just the perception. So we don't wanna I don't wanna give the notion that well if you just perceive something different like people Because it's like if you tell somebody to stop something because the ancestors or yourself know that they should stop doing it because it's the wrong thing to do. It's like a habit, you know, and I know it's hard to break habits, but you try to warn someone and they don't listen. And you're warning them, you're saying because you're repeating it or because you believe that if they don't listen, something's going to happen is actually making it happen? Oh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is if if somebody has a false perception, mm-hmm. then they will engage in behavior based on the false perception, and that behavior will cause problems. So if somebody saw the, the, the um, spider, right. it's not just their perception that made them get sick. Once they perceived it and they set in motion physiological changes, which is the constriction of the nerves around the muscle, the muscles get mm-hmm. tight, then they have stress, pressure on their organs, then it makes them sick and everything else. But if they made a different decision, they wouldn't set those physiological changes in process. Now, that's okay. that's internal, based on conditioning, and then you have to deprogram yourself. But then at the same time, if you go through that process and then you do go through that stress, well, then stress opens up pores, and then that compromises your immunity then those things outside of you that normally couldn't hit you, now they can get Get in. Okay. Then, and that's external. That has nothing to do with your perception. You can perceive all you want. It doesn't matter what. If a a microbe, you know, if a a mosquito is about to fly in and bite somebody, that's not perception. It's about to fly in and bite. If they took some herbs and the mosquitoes felt repelled by the smell of the garlic that's in their blood and didn't want to bite them, that's because they took precautions and they repelled the mosquito. If somebody else was eating a whole lot of sweet stuff and the mosquitoes were around and they just wanted to bite them and suck their blood or whatever, that's an external entity coming in and taking advantage because the person didn't protect themselves or they were neglectful or whatever. If we engage in things that lead to stress and so forth or a lack of perception, then we won't protect ourselves or we set ourselves up to compromise our own immunity. And once the immunity is compromised, now the external factors, entities, individuals, or others can come and start causing problems. So the first thing you want to do, if it's an external, if somebody, it's just like your house. If you leave all the lights on, leave the door open and music on, and you walk out the house and drive down the street and people see that, then you just set yourself up. Now, it's probably a bad perception thinking, oh, well, this is a nice neighborhood or whatever. That's you internally. But once you leave the Negro comes into your house, that's not perception. He's coming into the house, right? And you left it open because you were being neglectful. So the first thing you want to do, you want to make sure you're not neglectful. Keep the house closed. Recognize where you are. You know, defend yourself, purify yourself, strengthen yourself so you're not continuously opening yourself up to these negative entities. You strengthen and solidify yourself, and then you deal with these negative entities as well. So the Unsumafo can help repel negative 
just spirits as well as the negative projections of people who are projecting negativity on people, um, as well as the abosom and so forth. But first we have to, you know, take care of our own internal stress, and you can do it simultaneously. You go to the shrine, you're asking for a direction to, you know, solidify yourself and also protect against those outside of yourself. And when you can protect against those outside of yourself, because you solidify yourself, you're no longer a big magnet pulling these negative entities in. When somebody gets on crack cocaine, they start drawing other people who are on the same frequency. And even if they say, well, I'm going to go over here because it's a bunch of them in this region and it's a lot of crime, I'm going to go on the other side of town. But if they're still on crack, they're still drawing those same kinds of people no matter where they go. But as soon as they clean themselves up, and then they walk down the street and so forth. The people who are still on crack, they can see it's a different kind of energy and aura, and they're like, well, we can't deal with this person. They're not on this. We can deal with somebody else who's more vulnerable and weak like we are, but we can't deal with them. They have that presence. They're not succumbing to this anymore. So it's the same thing. If we get on a negative frequency and we start drawing like, like a major magnet and start pulling negative individuals and other people's negative projections, and we're open to that, and it will assault us. So we have to strengthen ourselves. You can always relate it to the physical body. If you get sick, the first thing you do is take something to, you know, build up your immune system, restore yourself, strengthen yourself, so that when you go out into the house and into the workplace, even if other people are coughing on you, you can repel it. Easy. If you don't take care of your health and you allow your health to deteriorate inside, then mm -hmm. when other people are coughing and hacking and at work, then you, your immunity is compromised, and they're gonna they're coughing and hacking and viral bacteria and stuff is gonna get onto you, and you'll get hit with it as well. But if you strengthen yourself, you could stand right next to somebody. You can be married to somebody and sleep right next to them, and they're coughing all night, and you don't get sick because you built up your spiritual, your physical immunity. So it's the same right. way. And, 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 and I agree. I'm just trying to find a way. How do I get my children to understand that? without overwhelming them or scaring them. Right. So on one hand, you can give them some information. Sometimes they'll reject certain things, but you're just consistent with it without, you know, browbeating them with it, but making sure it is available at all times. That's one thing. The other thing is consistency with your own ritual practice, because once you start oscillating on that certain vibration, is no different than a tuning fork, and these are your children who came out of your womb. Just like a tuning fork, if you make a tuning fork oscillate and vibrate, and then you put another one near it, it will start to vibrate and vibrate at the same frequency. So once you start oscillating and vibrating at that harmonious frequency, it's going to affect them even unconsciously. When they see you're consistent with your practice, and they see you're on a harmonious frequency, no matter what your surroundings are, but you're on a harmonious frequency, that's going to start affecting them. And it's going to force okay. some openings within them, force some valves to open within them, even if they're not trying to be, even against their will, it's going to make them some kind of receptive because they're going to notice, notice there's something different about you. So on one hand, you make information available. On the other hand, you keep yourself, you know, strong and solidified, and then you also seek the assistance from the unsamapo and ask them to, you know, get on, jump on your on your kids when you're not around them, and constantly okay. put that pressure on them. So they're feeling pressure when they're away from you, and they're feeling, you know, energy when they're around you. And then okay. when they're around you in the house, but they're not in the same room, they see the other information is available, and then they start getting cornered into, without even realizing, cornered into trying to embrace some information. So we got to surround okay. them, you know. <laughs> it's like surrounding them like a, you know, getting a drop on them, getting them surrounded where they can't, they have no option to get out. So they just okay. feel this, you know, ring of energy externally and internally where they're like, you know what, maybe I need to listen to something. And internally they'll start saying, well, maybe I need to move in a certain direction. Exactly. Hmm. Like there, we have. Um, send, send me that email though, and then I can send you specific. Um, some of the specific okay. broadcasts to deal specifically with that. Okay, could you repeat your email address? Um, yes. Yeah, so you can send it to. As a matter of fact, um, the, the way it's spelled is 
A A, so that's two A's, A A, K H U, A, so it's A A K H U A, M U, so that's Aquamu, A A, K H U, A M U, Aquamu, at OGRAFO.com, and OGRAFO is O D W. I R A F is in free O dot com. And you, you can also connect with me on Facebook, Quasi Akan on Facebook. Um we're OG Dafo on Twitter and OG Dafo on YouTube. And on every YouTube video we also have the link to our website. And through the website, the email is on the website as well. So you can always get to us through the website, through Facebook, Blog Talk, Twitter, um, YouTube, all those different sites. Okay, and I appreciate everything that you've said, um, and I will definitely send you the email. And, you know, okay. I'm up. going to make sure I rebroadcast this, even if they're not paying attention, hopefully subconsciously they will pay attention while I try that's to move things forward. That's actually one of the one um, good strategy, and that's something we've used and other people have used as well. For example, the Kukutunsun, the Ancestral Jurisdiction, which you'll see that on the website as well, and that's also on YouTube. We play that, let that play while, wait until they fall asleep, and then mm-hmm. let it play while they're sleeping so it's seeping in. And it deals with the cosmological foundation of creation, the nature of our culture, ancestral, and it's in a narrative format, not a scholastic type format, but more like Telling a story in a sense from the okay. beginning of creation all the way through where we are right now, as well as the fictional characters, the Bible, Quran, Talmud, and everything, but also our ancestral culture, our values, developing good character, and everything else. So once they fall asleep, turn that on a little bit low, and they will get into their sensum, into their spirit, whether they okay. like it or know it or not. Okay. I appreciate everything. Okay, made us that we appreciate the call. Thank you. Okay, so um, just want to scroll through real quick uh, to make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat room. Uh, if you live in a place where in a in the chat room, if you live in a place where you can't keep a shrine set up or burn incense, what's another way to cleanse? So there's a couple of things. Very often people do have those situations where people either, you know, have people scared to death of shrines because they're Christians or Muslims or whatever, or you're just in a space where you can't have one or if you burn some incense or something, they start getting nervous or, or people just don't want smoke in the house and things like that. On one hand, you can always uh, give offerings at the base of a tree. You can go outside, of course, pour libation. You can go to the river, pour libation, go to the base of a tree, give offerings and pour libation and so forth. If you cannot go outside, if you're in a small space, you can establish a uh, portable, in Combre, a portable shrine. Simply meaning you can always pull out a small white cloth. You can get a small little bowl, get the stone. You can pour water in there, close your door, communicate with your instant muscle. And once you are done, you can pack those things up and put them back in your case or you know, whatever you have, and very often people do that. Even sometimes when we travel out of state, we'll take, you know, a bowl, we'll take, you know, um, a cup to pull libation and things like that. And even if we're in a hotel room and it's in the wintertime and we're doing a presentation, we'll take a miniature shrine set up and we'll take it and do that as well. So we're going to get into that process. All right. Because, of course, the Nsumafo know that you're seeking to communicate with them. They are assigned to us. The Abosom, who you came into the world with, are assigned to you. Of course, you have your own crowd, your soul, divine consciousness. So when you speak, you know, in an authentic way, sincere way to align with the divinities that are connected to you in the Nsumafo, they will give you that information. They will connect with you. Okay. Um, and as we move forward, the, some of the people who came in a little bit later, um, when you look, let me post the link once again. 
post that right back in the chat room because it went further up. So we just posted the Who Do Mind link again to our Who Do Mind page. Of course, this broadcast is about our Who Do Mind, Who Do Nation Festival, which is occurring October 17th in Washington, D.C., from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. It is a free event. Um, we're going to have a number of vendors selling natural products dealing with ancestral culture, religion, roots, herbs, natural soaps, um, shea butter, um, clothing, a um, number of different things. We're also going to have presenters. We will be doing a presentation on who do the Akan religion, ancestral religion, North America, and a couple of other presenters we are working on bringing out. Um, there's a couple of things we are actually in the midst right now, tonight, of raising funds to assist in bringing the presenters out of course. The workshops are free, um, so a couple of the presenters need some assistance with regard to travel expenses from out of state. You can go to our website, the Who Do Mind website right now, and if you would like to make a donation, we accept that. Any donation of $15 or more, we can send you one or more of our books. Of course, if you purchase one of our soft cover books from our publications page, that will assist us in, um, you know, this effort. And also, for those who would like to place an ad in our Who Do My Journal, initially it was yesterday, but no, no, today and into the morning um, is the last day because we need those JPEG files so that we can begin to format the journal. Of course, the Who Do My Journal will have articles on who do and so forth and natural health, all of the vendors, but it will also be a business directory for Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, those who take out those ads, and that journal will be given to everybody who comes to the event as a free journal in color and so forth, eight and a half by 11 magazine size. Um, and they will, once they leave the event, they will carry that journal to their friends, family, coworkers, and so forth. So your business or your personal ad. Some people have just placed a personal ad in the journal just saying they're supporting the work that we're doing, utilizing, you know, putting some ancestral wisdom in the ad or ancestral symbol, like an Adinkra symbol in the ad with some proverbial wisdom and supporting the work that we are doing. The one-fourth page ad is $25. The one-half page ad is $35. And the full page ad is, is $50. Um, and, and we have been talking about it since this past I will see that Sunday. So we, and we have put the website up last week, so we have made a deadline for tonight so we can get the formatting done so we can begin to print the journal. Um, and we can do it in time. Of course, we have to order some of the ink and everything. We publish all of our journals and our books in-house, in color, on our own printers. So if you'd like to support the work we're doing and to help to bring a couple of our sisters out to present on natural medicine, natural herbs, and so forth, please go to our Who Do Mind page right now. You can either purchase ad space. Um, it's right there on the page. Or make a donation, and yet I say we appreciate that. We see that um, we just saw that somebody made a donation just now, so yet I say for making that um, donation, making that payment, we appreciate that. Um, so, yes, you can do that now. And we're going to scroll up real quick to make sure we didn't miss anything else in the chat room. Okay, just want to make sure we didn't hit that. Okay. And as we go up, there's one other piece we wanted to touch on with regard to this notion of this transcarnational inheritance of the culture. And there's a specific text in nature that we wanted to read from that is in the Hoodoo book so that we can see there's a specific one. We want to find the page so you can go to it as well. Okay, and one of them is on page 19. It's on page 19, and then we have another one on page 20 in the Hoodoo People book. So if you look at page 19, um, one of the instructions of Ani from the papyrus, as they call it, the papyrus bulak number four, one of the many sets of instructions or maxims referred to as the wisdom literature in ancient Kemet. This copy, the copy of this work is dated to the 21st dynasty in Kemet, but the composition is shown to have been 
in the 18th so-called dynasty of approximately 3,500 years ago. So that you see the medutu, the symbol, then the transliteration in the language of Kemet, and then the English translation, three different lines talking about the information. Uh, the, the transliteration in the language of ancient Kemet, Ndunu, Ntoroku, Sao, Tu, Erna, Betal, Tu, which means an offering to the deity, um, to your deity, rather, guard against that which the divinity abominates or detests. Don't give an offering to the divinity that the deity taboos or that's objectionable, objectionable to the divinity. Talking about when making those ritual offerings to the Abosom, you are invoking guard against offerings which the Abosom detests. What is important about that specific um, instruction in the wisdom literature, when it says when making ritual offerings, the actual term is ndun or nduru, which are the ritual offerings. So what it's really saying is when making your hudu to the divinity, guard against that which he abominates or she abominates or detests. Hudu being utilized in context within ancient Kemet, exactly the way we use it in the Akan tradition on the continent, but specifically in North America today. So we're talking about giving hoodoo or doing hoodoo and so forth, guard against that which the divine forces in nature detect. Only give those offerings that are in harmony with divine order. So this is the term and the function of hoodoo and do op operating within the ancient culture, exactly the way we, it operates today. Then we go to another portion of the text, the actual um, translation of the text says the sanctuary of the deity or the abosom detests too much idol speaking in its sanctuary or shrine. Make your prayers or invocations with a heart which is loving or lawful, whose invocations are internal and not boastful. The abosom, the deity, will attend to the work you are doing ritually. Hear that which you have inquired about and accept your offering. So when you engage in ritual prayer and ritual offering, not idle speaking at the shrine, not boastful speaking at the shrine, not idle speaking at the shrine, the Abosom detests too much idle speaking. Make your prayers and invocations with a heart which is in harmony with the law or quote unquote love. Love and law is the same word in our ancient languages. Make your invocation with a heart which is in harmony with the law. You only want to align yourself with thoughts, intentions, and actions that are in harmony with divine order, not your just misguided desires, not idle desires, idle talking that the apostom rejects or quote unquote detests. The only thing you desire is what is in harmony with divine order. Am I engaged in thoughts, intentions, and actions that are in harmony with divine order, or do I need to make an adjustment? So you're going through the forces in nature to realign yourself. So what you desire is to harmonize with divine order, thoughts, intentions, and actions. You don't go to the Abosom trying to give offerings and engage in prayers to conscript them to do what you want them to do, because, of course, they never will. They do not obey human beings. And any fool who says that, whether they're a priest or priest, says that they control the deities or tell them what to do. This is just a clown dealing with discarnate perverse, crackhead-type spirits and calling them dead. They have no knowledge whatsoever of what they're talking about. You have a lot of Negroes on the continent as well as here talking about, oh, we don't worship the divinities. We tell them what to do. That's pure idiocy. That's a straight, straight lie. So, and it proves that they're not dealing with any deities at all. No oration, no vodou, no abosom, pure. So, you don't conscript the abosom and try to force them to do what you want them to do, force the orisha, force the vodou to do what you want them to do. You go to them to find out what is in harmony with divine order. You are a cell within the great divine body. The liver cell doesn't go to the, its parent, the liver, and say, well, why don't you stop, you know, oxidizing blood and just, you know, start doing something else. The liver cell tries to harmonize with the, its parent organ, its parent, quote, unquote, divinity. When we go to them, we want to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order and make sure we eradicate disordered desires and 
so forth within us. So we don't engage in idle speaking, idle desires. We make our prayers and invocations with a heart which is loving or lawful, whose invocations are internal and not boastful. The abosom will attend to the work you are doing ritually, hear that which you have inquired about, and accept your offer. What's important, of course, here, if, when we look at the actual um, translation and transliteration, when it says the divinity will accept your offering, the term for offering is undu, unduru. So the divinity will accept your undu or your kudu when you engage in a ritual invocation that is in harmony with law, your heart being aligned with the will of the supreme being. This, once again, is who do in action, talking about morality, talking about aligning our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And when you engage that process, then the abosom will accept your offerings, your unduru, your kudu, and then you can realign yourself with order. So that's the key. All right. So one of the... Um, we see another couple of comments in the chat room. So one of them comments, how can I change my luck? I need to move, find a new home. How can I make this happen? Who should I work with? And so forth. My twins, age, boys. All right. So and one thing now, this notion of luck, whether it's luck or on the other side, accident. So there's no such thing as accidents because every effect has a cause. So there may be things that you may not have wanted to happen, but there's no such thing as an accident, like something that wasn't supposed to happen and it happened. Everything happens because it's, there's a cause behind everything that takes place, whether we know it or perceive it or not. At the same time, there's no such thing as luck in the real sense, like, oh, that was just a lucky break. In reality, there was a cause. There were certain things that were in, in operation you know, in operation to make that thing unfold the way it unfolds. We may not have been able to perceive the different years that we're going to make these things unfold, but they were unfold. There was an agency behind that. So anytime you're trying to figure out what should I do, what's, the, what's in harmony with what you're really asking is, what is in harmony with divine order? And it's interesting, we just read that specific text before we saw this question. What is in harmony with divine order? What do I need to do to get my thoughts, intentions, and actions in harmony with order so that I can operate in a harmonious fashion and things will unfold in my life in a harmonious fashion and certain barriers, obstacles will be overcome or removed so that I can move forward? That's foundationally what you're asking every time you go to the shrine, every time you go to your insamapo, every time you go to the abosom, Every time you go to your own crop, your soul, your divine consciousness, everything you need to be doing, what your function in creation is, is encoded within the deity that dwells in the head region, the crop, the crop of the soul, the divine consciousness. The Nananoman Samampo, the ancestors and ancestors, show you what your crop is trying to show you. Sometimes we get distracted, can't, can't hear what our crop is directing us to do. The Samampo will assist you in being receptive to that and they'll give you the method by which you can, um, you know, operate and execute what your cry is directing you to do based on your clan affiliation. There's a certain way that we need to operate based on our clan because we've been part of a specific clan. We went migrated to different areas of the continent. We ate certain foods and developed certain taboos and all kinds of things all within our clan. We're allergic to certain things where other clans aren't. So only the Nsumampo, our direct blood ancestors and ancestors, know the way that we must harmonize with order as part of a certain clan, where it's, which is different from the way another group of people need to harmonize because they're from a different clan. Everybody's going to harmonize with the same forces in nature, but there's different pathways based on the clan you're from. Your direct blood ancestors and ancestors who mastered life as part of that clan and part of those specific taboos in that clan, they know how to do it. So when you're directed to execute your certain function, a military function or a healing function or whatever, that's coming directly from your own crop. That's what you're supposed to do. Your Unsan will say, yes, this is what you're supposed to do. 
but there's a specific way that you need to do that because you're part of this class. So certain foods you shouldn't be eating, certain things you shouldn't be doing, certain things you can do, certain things you can't do based on the class so that when you engage your function, it will be harmonious. So you deal with your kra, the divinity dwelling in the head region to find out exactly who you are, what your function in creation is. And you learn from your insomnia the means by which you must execute that function. And that is takes care of, okay, I need to move. What time should I need to move? How do I get put in the position where I come in contact with the people I need to come in contact with who have the space that I need to move into or can give me a break on a price? How do I put myself in that lane so I end up meeting the people? When you come in contact with somebody and they say, you know, you learn something spiritually or heard something spiritually or saw something spiritually, and then you come in contact with somebody, maybe you were, you know, you were on your way to work and there was, you know, some construction. You had to turn off that street and go down a road you normally don't go, but then you were about to run out of gas or you went to a gas station you normally normally don't go to, and then you somebody else came to the gas station and it turns out that they work at a real estate agency and they have the thing that exactly that you need and I have a deal that you need. When you were in line with the Unsumampo, just on a fundamental basis, everything that needed to happen that they needed to orchestrate to make sure you got to the um, gas station at the same time that this individual got there, they had to orchestrate these events. So when you're in alignment with them, they can put you on the right pathway to come in contact with the people you need to come, come in contact with so you can get what you need to get, which is harmonious. First, you need to know exactly what you need and what you don't need, what is lustful and what is a real need, what is a misguided desire and what is a, a natural desire, and so forth. So um, so dealing with the unsumafo directly and your kra directly, that aligns you. And then they put you in the position to connect with who you need to connect with. So um, when we did a broadcast, and again, you can email us, go to the website, email us. Um, we can show the specific broadcast. One of them is Okra, Okra, um, Ritual to Order Life, talking about the soul, the divine consciousness. Then we also have, we have a few in that series talking about dealing with the Kra, the Kra about the soul, the divine consciousness, as well, and also the Ba and the Ba, the divine living energy and so forth, Ritual to Balance Life and Celebrate Life and so forth. So we have a few broadcasts in, in that whole constellation of dealing with ritual practice for realignment. So just send us an email and we'll send you the direct um, links to those direct videos. All right. Okay. So it is about 11, almost 1130. Um, so we can wrap it up here. Yet I'll say. Um, and Yeni, I'll say that. We appreciate that. Okay. Hold on one second. Um, with saying things like Dwa, Anana, Sekmet, Ankh, Uja, Seneb, Neb, Mut, Sekmet, Nana, Ye, Hitep, et cetera, be considered idle speaking. No, those are, those are terms. Dwa means thank, to thank. Like thank you, dua means thank you and so forth, and um, you know all those different terms, names of divinity, ancestral prayers, and so forth. That's that's not idle speaking. Idle speaking is not aligning with what your function in creation is. Engaging in misguided desire, trying to go towards things that you don't necessarily need, or trying to you know um, talk the divinities and insomnia into you know sanctioning things that you really don't need and so forth because you just really desire them. You're going against your own cry. You're creating a bunch of foolish chatter we call kata kata in Akan or the same term, kata kata nature commit. Instead of doing all of that, just align with what your function is. Be desired to execute your divine function. And when you open up to that, whatever it is, and you're receptive to what your function is and what things you need to purge and what things you need to incorporate, now you're engaged in the proper process. You're not engaged in idle talk, idle speaking, and so forth. So again, um, yeah, so we're, we're going to be updating 
the page, the Hudu Mind page with the itinerary. Um, we have about four spaces for vending. So if you want to be a vendor at the event on October 17th, you can go to the Hudu Mind page right now. Um, vending a table with $25. We, we supply the six foot table and two chairs. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, you can go to that. We have about four spaces left. And then you can also, tonight is the last night for uh, dealing with the, if you want to place a personal ad in the journal, you can go to the website right now. And also, again, um, if you support the work that we are doing, you can go to the Who Do Mind page once again. You can make a donation. You can, any donation of $15 or more, we'll send you one or more of our books anyway. And thanks for the donation. You can let us know in the comment section of the uh, piece, um, you know, what book or books you would like to receive. Or go to the donation button now and assist us in bringing a couple of our sisters out to do presentations on natural healing, the use of herbs and tinctures and so forth. Um, any donation is helpful, of course. We want to assist with their travel expenses. Um, so whether it's ten dollars or five, fifteen, whatever it is, twenty, anything will be of assistance, and you can do that directly not only on the publications page, which is the regular books page, publications page, but also we also place the donation button on the Who Do Mind page, so you can um, do that as well. So, uh, Yeda, say we thank you for tuning in to the show. If you have any questions or comments, um, send us an email. You can connect with us on Facebook. You can connect with us now on Facebook, Kwesi Akan, or Ojirafo, or Afuraka Afuraka on Facebook, um, Ojirafo on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, of course, on Blog Talk, and you can connect with us. And, of course, we have our regular website, ojirafo.com. Our regular email address is on that website. So, Yerase, we thank you for tuning in, and Yebeshi Abio. We will meet again. This is Lori Grenier. You've seen me on Shark Tank. I'm always hearing from business owners who just can't get the money they need to grow. It's time for funding to catch up to the 21st century. It's time for Cabbage. Fill out the application online and you'll get a decision in minutes and could have access to a line of credit of up to $100,000. No waiting, no hassle. Cabbage is the real deal, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau and twice a Forbes Top 100 company. So go to Cabbage.com. That's Cabbage with a K, K-A-B-B-A-G-E, or call 888-CABBAGE.